these debates from the University of the West Indies and um, some of our own academics from King's College London School of Security to discuss what is, uh, I think we all agree, one of the most critical issues of our time. I hope this is going to be the first in, in a series of engagements and collaborations between School of Security, Department of War Studies and University of the West Indies. Um, so in opening, I'm going to say a few words about what we hope to achieve here and to provide a little context to open the discussion. Then each speaker will have sort of some, some time to talk, 10 minutes or so, a little longer, and then we can have a collective discussion with time for questions. Uh, and we have Isabella Duarte Francini, who, who, who's moderating the questions as they come in. So please put your questions into the chat when, when, when you have them. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, say the, the point at which questions are, are welcome. So let me start then firstly with a couple of words of opening. Um, of course, COVID-19, uh, the ongoing pandemic is widely described um, uh, across publications as a, as a wake up call um, for those of us in scholarship and in policy thinking about planetary health and its security implications. So that there are clear ways in which the pandemic is um, indicative or even emblematic of how climatic processes create and are tied up with security challenges that are harmful in the extreme to human well-being. Um, so zoonotic pandemics, as the ongoing one is, is one example, but also we could be talking about soil erosion, desertification, rising sea levels, the increasing strength of tropical storms. And all of these have primary, secondary and tertiary security implications that are national, that are regional, but also global and touch upon key issues about the nature of international order itself in some situations. So, Many elements of the COVID crisis that's ongoing uh, and indeed the response to it worldwide, so things like social distancing, uh, and involve quite significant changes at the social level. Uh, they involve significant governmental action and significant expense also. So there's some degree to which maybe there, there, there are grounds to hope and perhaps we can have some elements of a hopeful discussion today that um, the COVID crisis will set the diplomatic efforts soon to come at the next COP meeting in the UK later this year in a new light and perhaps you know allow or foster efforts by the international community to, to move towards a response that's adequate to the scale of the global security challenges that are tied up with climatic processes but uh, and one, one would think indeed that, that you know that the point about us needing to be prepared and to take action in advance to prevent this kind of thing might, might that lesson might have been learned uh, and be um, deployed in relationship to the wider climate crisis by negotiators. But with that kind of hope, I think we can also see some grounds for pessimism in thinking about global climate security in the light of COVID, um, inequality in the distribution of vaccines, um, and the centralization around the wealthier nations it is reflected, of course, in the unequal distribution of the costs of managing climate security risks, um, where those uh, to some extent experiencing the front line uh, of the climate crisis uh, bear the highest costs. And in, in some senses, the questions and challenges of solidarity uh, around climate in the aftermath or, or in the shadow of COVID, I think are, are, are significant in this context. So, you know, with these kinds of issues at stake, how could COVID-19 not impact and have, have a role in relationship to the UN discussions uh, around COVID? And around climate change. Uh, um, so I, I, in a sense that the question is, is, is what will that be? Um, now turning now to this event itself, um, what we're doing today is we're bringing together some scholars from the University of West Indies and School of Security to think through and discuss uh, in a kind of open way on um, the academics in, in, we, we have here are, are all experts in, in, in particular areas and I hope there's going to be some exciting synergies across our interests. Um, but to look fundamentally about how, at how pandemic COVID-19 frames the global security implications of climate change. Um, and I think, you know, it, one of the key drivers for this event uh, in part is, is you know, COVID-19 really does underscore some of the global differences at play and the, the ways in which differential exposure to the impacts of climate change uh, and also the ways in which knowledge and expertise about how to respond effectively to climate change are often centered in those states such as those in the Caribbean where the security implications of climate change have long been apparent. There's no, no surprises here. So um, this is a sort of inaugural round table of what I hope to be a wider set of discussions. And um, we're going to talk about two broad questions. The first being, you know, how talking specifically about Caribbean in this context, how, how Caribbean community member states experiences and expertise with relationship to climate security risks frame their response to the pandemic and, and vice versa. And, and to set this in the context of a second question, in what ways will or should this pandemic 
uh, influence international debates on tackling the climate emergency at the UN COP 2021. And so we are really exceptionally privileged to have um, Dr. Suzette Horton and uh, Hugh Seeley, Dr. Suzette Hugh Seeley um, from the University of the West Indies. Um, uh, Dr. Horton is head of the Department of Government um, and uh, senior lecturer in international relations and security studies at the University of West Indies. And uh, she's also herself a, a Department of War Studies alumni. So we're delighted to that, that, that she's come back to join us um, uh, for this discussion. Um, Dr. Yusili is a lecturer on climate change at the Center of Resource Management and Environmental Studies at the University of West Indies, um, Cape Hill Barbados. So sorry, I'm Dr. Horton is uh, at Mona Campus Jamaica. Um, he's a research fellow in the Windward Islands Research and Education Foundation and a, the director of the UNFCCC Regional Collaboration Center. He has enormous hands-on experience in relationship to environmental science and development questions and studying um, environmental impacts in the Caribbean region. So I'm really excited to hear um, both of their reflections. And from, from our side um, uh, in, in School of Security, we are delighted to have um, Simon Chidi, who has significant experience himself in international organizations in relationship to the UN um, ESCO and himself and his research examines climate change conflict in relationship to vulnerable populations with an emphasis on the African uh, region. Uh, and and his research is also focused on global climate negotiations and their relationship to national context. So I hope you can bring some of that knowledge to bear. And finally, we have Dr. Hilary Briffer, also from uh, School of Securities. She's the recipient of the UN State Department's inaugural Emerging Young Leaders Award and one of the inaugural Hans Morgenthau Fellows. Her research um, focuses on small, small states and post-colonial actors in the international systems and the way in which agency and questions of autonomy um, play out here. So she's currently involved in a project exploring uh, the implications for multilateralism, um, particularly in the context of small island states of the post-COVID era. So I'm really excited to open this discussion uh, and um, we'll start please with, um, uh, if I might open the um, open the discussion to Dr. Suzette Horton and if you'd be willing to open, I really look forward to this discussion and the debates that follow. Thank you so much for coming and uh, look forward to the conversation. Okay, uh, thank you, Nick. I bring greetings from the Department of Government at UWM Ona, uh, to my colleagues at King's College and to my colleague in um, Barbados. I'm extremely delighted to participate in this um, event. I have a short presentation, so uh, I'm not able to share my screen. It's saying host disabled attendee screen sharing. So if you could just allow me. Isabella. If not, then. Uh, let me just um, check that, bear with us a moment. Um, check if it's working now. It is now? Okay, let's see. Oh, perfect. Okay, let's stop. Oops. Oh dear. Let, let me try this again to share my screen. Okay. Let us stop. All right. So here we are. I'm trying to find the. Uh, just, just a second. Let me move this over. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. Move this over here. Okay, so my presentation today, I'll be looking at um, Caribbean climate security and COVID-19 pandemic. I hope to do this in just about 10 minutes. Oops. Okay, so this is a map of the Caribbean region showing the Caribbean island states, here Jamaica and the other um, island states. If you note carefully, the states are surrounded by either the Caribbean Sea or the North Atlantic Ocean. Okay, my approach, I'll be looking at a brief definition of climate change and climate security. 
I'll uh, then go directly into um, addressing Caribbean government's responses to COVID-19 and climate change and the impacts on the citizens and states. Then um, addressing the similarities and differences between COVID-19 and climate change. And of course the implications for human security. And then I look at the overall implications for Caribbean security governance. And I conclude with errors for further consideration. Now, climate change is seen as a threat multiplier. It places huge burden on the infrastructure of states and the viability of the nation state and the well being of the population and the physical, I'm sorry, okay. the physical security um, and environment. And climate security refers to um, people's communities and states' capacities to manage these climate-induced um, threats. In connecting COVID-19 and security and climate change, it's important to know that COVID-19 and climate change are considered as existential threats for the Caribbean region Climate change risk factors impact negatively on human security. And of course, they combine with other societal factors to indirectly undermine state stability and the state security. Things such as loss in the livelihood of um, citizens, their tougher economic realities in the region has pushed um, increased numbers of citizens to engage in criminal activities and unsustainable environmental practices in order to survive. And the region suffers from high homicide rates, gang presence, illegal gun possession, and transnational organized crime, particularly uh, drug trafficking and money laundering. Now, the Climate-induced risk factors that affect the Caribbean region involves uh, natural disasters, particularly floods and hurricanes, the water crisis, drought, um, rising sea levels, and extreme temperatures and heat. Now, COVID-19 has changed our lives dramatically. It has changed our social interaction. It has changed the economic activities within the region. And the Caribbean states have responded to COVID-19 by closing their borders, by imposing lockdowns and curfews, stay at home orders and work from home orders. And the entire pandemic has been securitized. The language around the pandemic has been securitized as well as measures that have been imposed to address um, COVID-19, such as the, the um, passage of certain laws, uh, as in the case of Jamaica, the Disaster Risk Management Act, which was amended to include the pandemic. pandemic. And law enforcers have been given um, sort of extraordinary powers uh, in order to impose fines on citizens who leave their homes without good reasons during the lockdowns or during the curfews or for those citizens who refuse to wear masks. Now, in terms of the impacts on the states and, in cities, uh, and the citizens, these impacts have been profound. Uh, impacts have been seen in terms of the public health emergencies, the economic pressure, additional economic pressure that the state, um, in the states in the regions have, uh, have faced and also the deepening economic and, and debt crisis. And this has resulted negatively on individuals. So we, we are seeing uh, greater levels of social and economic inequity within the society. And there are also concerns surrounding food, food insecurity. Now, the Caribbean region as a whole 
has been responding to um, climate change. Each of the countries have um, dedicated ministries or agencies to address the impact of um, climate change. So for instance, in Jamaica, we have a specific um, ministry. It's called um, the Ministry of Land, Environment and Climate Change. And this ministry has been prioritized on the, the office of the prime minister. So that's the sort of significance that has been placed on um, climate change. All members, um, Caribbean member states have signed and have ratified the Paris um, Agreement and the countries have laid out certain plans to um, address renewable energy sources. Uh, nationally, um, states are embarking on protecting ecologically sensitive areas. And for, for instance, in Jamaica, there has been the passage of the National Protected Act, which uh, prioritizes and identifies 15 areas that are considered as ecologically sensitive areas that needs to be protected. And the government is also embarking on um, what they consider as efforts to, to address um, carbon fixing. So each individual, each citizen within the, the country can access 10 trees to plant and these trees are free. And the government is also embarking on renewable um, energy by establishing a, a wind farm, a wind farm known as the Wigton Wind Farm. And this is the largest wind farm in the English speaking uh, region, Caribbean region. Now looking at the similarities and differences between climate change and um, COVID-19. Uh, climate change and COVID-19 both affects um, human health uh, as it relates to climate change. Extreme heat is likely to worsen the impact and air pollution can increase the risk of contracting COVID-19 as well as can increase the death rates associated with um, COVID-19. Likewise, uh, climate change, poor uh, air quality due to greenhouse gas emissions affect human health. And of course, this can also result in uh, loss of life. Now, uh, COVID-19 has resulted in economic fallout for the Caribbean region which impacts um, negatively on servicing of debt and also increase states borrowing um, capability and um, borrowing capability. So they have to, to borrow more, not so much their capability, but they have to borrow more in order to fund COVID related activities such as vaccine and having the um, the medical supplies and the ne necessary um, worship fitting of um, hospitals, etc. And climate change, global warming, um, which causes ri rising sea levels, imposes an external threat to Caribbean nation states, and this affects um, negatively the tourism sector as hotels in the region are really located on the coast and states now will have to borrow more in order to improve um, climate change resilience. Now, COVID-19 is seen as something that is fast moving. It has almost hit us overnight and we have to, um, states and, and individuals have to respond um, quickly. Whereas climate change is considered as something that is more slow moving, it's a centuries long problem. Uh, COVID-19 is impacting across the globe and the climate change is providing or, or producing uneven impacts across the globe. COVID-19 will likely pass, but um, climate change is, is slow, but is also an ongoing um, problem and will span over many generations. 
in terms of the responses, COVID-19, the responses from, from government, from individuals, the, the responses were immediate concerning climate change, the response is, is a little slow and uneven. And also in terms of public perception or public expectation is that uh, there should be immediate action and, and response from the government. Um, and these responses should be translated into uh, policy response and should impact on behavior change. Whereas for climate change, the, the public expectation is a little different. It's, um, there's a lower expectation as it relates to an immediate response and people are less likely to immediately change your behavior. But um, people, and, and the case, why, why this is so is because is the, the people have the perception that this is um, climate change is a lower risk as compared to COVID-19 which is seen as a higher risk. Overall implications for the Caribbean region as it relates to security governance, there's need for improved food security, social protection and health. There's also need for enhanced national security protocols to address severe natural disasters and the strengthening of government and civil society institutions to meet the challenge of disaster management and all of these uh, measures should um, prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable within our societies. And finally, in terms of the conclusion and areas for further consideration, there's need to think about vertical agriculture to align with how um, buildings and cities have been expanding um, in the region. Uh, vertical agriculture to deal with um, high rise buildings and to also embark on innovative irrigation systems. There's also a need to switch to electric cars and for people to change the way they live. So our lifestyles must change and even the way we eat um, should change. And there's need for sensitization and preservation and also about conservation. And importantly, um, Caribbean govern governments will need um, public finance in order to address issues that will emerge and that are emerging from um, climate change and COVID-19. So I thank you. That's my contribution in terms of presentation today. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Horton. I think some really interesting, um, some really interesting points here, particularly around the, the way in which um, climate change, you know, is it, perceived as being this kind of lower risk phenomena relative to something like COVID nineteen. But of course, COVID nineteen is, is, is both a, a much longer term process, and, and indeed the costs are probably likely to be higher uh, over time. Now, I, I think what we'll do is I'll, I'll give everybody their chance to talk, and then we'll we'll have a discussion at the end. Um, thank you so much. And um, now I'll pass it over to, to Dr. Husili um, next, uh, and and uh, to, to speak if if you're happy. Um, uh, well, well, thanks, Nicholas, and, and, and thank you for, for having me, um, and, and, and welcome to all the participants. I'm afraid I have no slides, I have no prepared speech, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to free flow, okay? Um, and I'm not a security expert. Um, um, my forte, if I do have one, is, is talking about climate change. Um, and one of your first questions, Nicholas, was, was, do we have any particular expertise or better perspective on has how to deal with COVID because we are small island people and we, we're, we're having to deal with a climate emergency? Um, and I thought a lot about that question and, and I, my simple answer is no. Um, uh, at least I don't think so, but I'll, I'll, I'll draw upon that. But just imagine the situation in Barbados where we had a change in administration in 2018. Um, the economy was in dire straits. We went to the IMF. We, we had a 170 something percent debt to GDP ratio. 
We spent 2019 trying to dig ourselves out of a huge financial hole and we were getting there. 2020 was supposed to be a year of celebration. We were supposed to bring Barbadians from all over the diaspora to Barbados every month we would bring back people. And we started well in January, went into February and then COVID hit. Within weeks, our tourism went to zero. To zero, right in the middle of our tourism season, the peak of our tourism season. The net result being a 20% loss in GDP in 2020. We went from a $5 billion US dollar economy to a $4 billion US dollar economy in one year. And we are in an IMF program at the start. So when you ask me how we dealt with COVID, I'm, I'm surprised that I'm still talking to you. I'm surprised that I still have a job. And, and a lot of us don't, and, and, and that's a problem. So let me go back then to, to the question about whether we handled it that any better than, than others have. I think some of our statistics or public health statistics are showing, yes, we've had less, less cases, less hospitalizations, uh, less deaths on a, on a, on a per capita uh, uh, basis. We do have a significant geographical advantage in the fact that we're surrounded by water and, 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 and therefore it's fairly easy to close to close or, or to manage or, or borders. Yes, things we did not do well. Uh, we're supposed to be a Caribbean community. Uh, did, we, did we approach uh, the, the COVID-19 situation collectively? Was there any coherent CARICOM response to COVID-19? I see Dr. Houghton shaking her head because I agree with her. No, it was every island for itself. We even closed borders on ourselves, on our own citizens trying to get back home and left them stuck in neighboring countries. Did Barbados do well by not closing its border? That's a question as, that, as to whether that should be on the plus side or the negative side, because at one stage in 2020, we were COVID free, free. we fought it and we blocked it. And then we reopened our borders perhaps, or we never closed our borders, let's put it that way. And tourists started to come back, but then they came back with the UK variant. And now we're back into a lockdown again. And we're gonna have to face that as, as to, okay, well, how do we come out of this safe? Um, and the only passageway that we see is, okay, we all get vaccinated. But as, you, as you've clearly indicated, on the vaccination front is every country uh, for, its, for itself. And uh, we are way down the, 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 the totem pole uh, when it comes to receiving vaccines. Although Barbados has done significantly better than other islands well, because of vaccine diplomacy from India, not from our traditional developed country partners. Okay. And at the same time when this was going on, we dismantled our regional airline, Liat, at least the one that's, that services the Eastern uh, Caribbean. So, so we have that loss of ability to, to, to go back and forth anyway. What did we do well? I think we planned well because we saw it happening in Europe. We saw it happen in the US. We had a couple of months of, of, of leeway that we could, we could plan. And therefore we built out purpose-built um, uh, quarantine facilities. And, and, and we did that rapidly. And that, and that allowed us not to overwhelm our, our hospital facilities and, and make sure that all COVID-19 related uh, cases could go to this specialized uh, facility. We relied heavily on what's traditionally a strong public health program, at least in Barbados, where we've had socialist democratic uh, governments for, for uh, decades now, uh, with, with significant expenditure on education and health, um, and, and that paid off because we have the polyclinics. And even then, we, we thank you, Cuba, we still board um, over 100 nurses uh, from, from Cuba who are still here uh, helping us. 
I think one of the good things we did from a business standpoint is we maintained communication with the cruise ship industry. Even though the cruise ship industry had shut down, uh, Barbados became a home port for several cruise ships uh, operating with the skeleton crews, but we managed to get the passengers off of the, off the cruise ships. I think that we built up some, some brownie points uh, with, the, with the cruise ship industry, and that may redound to our benefit in the future uh, with, with more uh, cruise ship passengers coming uh, per year. Never waste a good crisis. I think it was Naomi Klein, uh, she was talking about shock doctrine, um, a Canadian author. So I think this, this reliance on tourism, I think it was obvious to us before, but it was, it, it was made cruelly apparent that, that we are over-reliant on, on, on tourism. And I think all of us have taken that on board, both the public and, and, and the private sector. And, 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 and there's gonna be a strong, strong push to, to diversify uh, our economy. Um, even within the tourism sector itself, we're looking to, to at that model to see, does that model really work? Have we, have we moved now to the mass tourism type of model? Should we pull back from that? And now we have this long stay welcome stamp where we're trying to bring uh, people in for 12 months to let them stay here, work here, spend their money here, et cetera. Um, we were losing a lot of the tourism dollar anyway uh, because of the, of, of the model that had been set up. There's a new focus on our culture. And, and, I, and I, I'm really, really pleased about that because that seems to be an alignment where, where you have a crisis, there's, a, there's an impact on your, on your supply chains. Uh, people get worried that, that, that the supermarkets are not going to have food. And all of a sudden, there's a mad push back towards agriculture. Everyone starts to grow things back in the backyard um, again, and, and large farms start start switching back to to, to uh, producing uh, vegetables and fruits for the local market. And that also then exposes the 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 fact that we don't have the water for irrigation. So now we're pushing towards a massive national water reclamation program, where we're going to spend about four percent of our GDP. Uh, four percent of our GDP over the next few years uh, to to put a reclaimed water distribution network in place to allow for better agricultural productivity as a direct result of of, of this feeling of insecurity that we, uh, we that we now have because of, of COVID nineteen. I think our populations responded very well to 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 the protocols, the role of government. In, 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 in this COVID-19 impact. I, I found that interesting. I'm not a political scientist by any stretch of the um, and, uh, imagination, I'm a chemical engineer, but I, I got a feeling that those who are very strong on the feeling of the individual versus the feeling of the collective or the, or, or the government are those that did not respond very well to the, to the protocols that were put in place. In our island, there, there is a culture of compliance. Perhaps there's, there's a culture of knowing the role of government, and we have had significantly good compliance with wearing of masks, distancing, sanitization, uh, etc. Some would argue that our governments have been too harsh on, on offenders. Um, we have put people in jail because of, of, of breaking of, of, of curfews. This, this Easter weekend that is coming up, we are in lockdown mode. We are, we are in stay at home mode and it's it's hard we, we missed prop over our carnival last year which is a, a a social safety valve and we're gonna probably gonna miss prop over again or carnival again uh this this year does that mean that we have pent up frustration in the society that's going to come out at some point i i do not know on the last week because I, I i said i wasn't going to speak too long on the turning the question around nicholas on the impact of COVID now on the COP26 uh, negotiations. And, and now I'll put on my hat as a negotiator for, for, for the Alliance of Small Island uh, States. So, so COVID-19 has been a disaster for, for climate change negotiations. Yes, there's been a small blip in the number of uh, amount of emissions that, that we're putting out. Uh, but we've delayed for a year and, and, and Glasgow is not guaranteed in November. At least a face-to-face -face is still not guaranteed in, in, in November. And, and to push back even another year is, is 
At this time, when we're supposed to be submitting our, our nationally determined contributions for, for 2030, when we're supposed to be talking about the $100 billion goal per year, whether we've met it, where we're supposed to be talking about the new collective quantified goal for climate finance for 2025, where are we going to delay all of that for, for, for another two years? So on the positive side, does this give us a, a chance to do the great reset that, that some, some of our friends at the World Economic Forum have been talking about? Does this give us an opportunity to build forward better? Because I'm not building back anything. I'm not building back any fossil fuel industry. So don't tell me we'll build back better. Tell me we'll build forward better. So is this a time now where we can see that, that this is an opportunity for us to, to build forward better? Are we grasping that opportunity? Are, are, we, are we stopping investment? Are we stopping in, in fossil fuels? Are we stopping subsidies in, 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 in fossil fuels? I'll leave that as a question. Uh, to the panels. Thanks, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Dr. Celia. It's a, a loads of really interesting stuff. I hope we can take up uh, in, in, in the later conversations. So some of the points are around sort of vaccine diplomacy and which states have been involved, I think, in, in the region, I think, are, are, is important. And also the interesting reversal whereby the response to COVID in the region has actually produced changes in the way in which management of water and so on is also interesting. But the point you make at the end around climate negotiations is, is, is obviously absolutely critical and, and really important uh, and one we need to continue to take up. Thank you very much for your contribution. That's great. Um, I, I, I'll now pass on to Simon, please, um, to, 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 to take up the conversation um, going forwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Nick, uh, as well. And thank you to, to Suzette and Hugh for their, um, for their interventions. Really, really interesting to be on this panel. I very rarely get to speak on panels with, uh, with uh, our partners in the Caribbean. And, uh, and I've worked with the University of West Indies in Barbados in the past, about a decade ago, actually. And my father's actually from Jamaica. So this is a, but I actually work mostly on African states, as, a, as Nick said in the introduction. So my intervention, hopefully, uh, what Dr. Houghton and Dr. Seeley have already spoken about, and I'm going to focus uh, focus my intervention on climate justice and human security, and what that means for the global South in general. And hopefully, I'll be able to bring in some examples. But uh, as we have a, a panel full of uh, panelists full of uh, uh, from the region itself, uh, hopefully, I'll just complement that. And, and then finally, I'll look again, uh, to complement what Dr. Seeley just said and to figure out how this will play out in COP26 at the end of this year, potentially, uh, and, the, and the involvement of and, and COVID-19 and what that means for justice in the climate negotiations. So in terms of climate justice itself, or maybe I should be calling it climate injustice, actually, uh, this is there because uh, it's, the, it's the least those the most vulnerable uh, that are least able to adapt that are feeling the, uh, the greatest effects the feeling the effects most acutely. So these least developed countries are in the global south, and there are so many reasons uh, that uh, that human security is affected by climate change. Uh, I could I I have a list as long as my arm, but uh, a few of them uh, are for island states, for example. One of the is of course sea level rise whether you're in the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the islands of Kiribati, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, Maldives, Seychelles, uh, Barbuda, uh, Barbados, every, they're all, everyone is, uh, is impacted by, uh, by sea level rise. Um, in terms of extreme weather events, Dr. Houghton uh, already brought this up, the idea that extreme weather events are, 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 are are becoming more extreme um, and they're affecting also island states, but actually not only island states, as we've seen with flooding and, and, and these events that in Texas, Florida should be super worried about what, what's happening to them right now. Mozambique two years ago, I'm sure many of you remember Hurricane Idai when it plowed into Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe, killing a thousand people, flattening the town of Bira uh, and causing a, a massive humanitarian crisis in, the, in that region. Desertification. Desertification is bringing is uh, is, uh, is is forcing people to move. We see this mostly in, especially in the in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, as people moving within the countries, but as opposed to what we think a 
here in Europe is everyone's trying to move into Europe, but actually that's not the case at all. Most people are not leaving the countries themselves. The Fulani herders in Nigeria are moving south, but they're still in Nigeria, but they're coming into conflict with, uh, with farmers, for example, further south. And this, uh, and this brings up all that, I, that, that notion of these conflicts. Uh, these, these, uh, this notion of, um, uh, that Dr. Houghton also brought up of um, exacerbating exacerbating conflicts, but that's see, and this is what we see in security um, reports from almost twenty years now, from out of the Pentagon, out of the UK, out of the EU, that associate climate change with human security, mostly in looking at uh, areas of already um, a volatile zones, such as South Africa, such as India, such as Indonesia, and so they're all. Um, these are all, these are some, just some of the issues that climate change raises in terms of human security. Now, within the negotiations, for example, there is this concept called the right to exist. The fact that this concept exists in the first place tell, is telling in terms of climate justice. And uh, Dr. Seeley, I'm sure uh, you could speak better on this than I could as being a negotiator for Oasis, but, one of, but if you're from one of those, a small island state, for example, you're literally fighting for your right to exist within the climate negotiations. So there are two sides to this though. So the first side, so one of, so if we bring up this idea, this notion of the climate refugee, a climate refugee is not officially in the international lexicon uh, at the moment. Now, should it be? That's the question. So on one side of the equation, yes, maybe it should be. There's a contingency plan there. If you're Kiribati right now, you might be, uh, you uh, are looking to uh, see where your future is. And if you have this sort of legalized uh, vocabulary, it might be easier for you or maybe important for you in the future if you are being forced to leave. There have been two cases that I'm aware of in New Zealand of small island states um, that have this. But on the, on the flip side of that, this is the problem within the negotiations. On the other side of that, you have uh, the fear that if we accept the fact that a climate refugee is existing, that, it, that this will give those large emitters carte blanche to keep emitting. And so this is what a lot of the island states are fighting against. The first, to stop them emitting and to, and to recognize the problem and the issues that are the situation that they are in. But the second is also, is also a fear that this will be a, a, an acceptance and that for them, it is really, really mitigation that is important here, uh, not migration. No one wants to be a climate refugee. No one wants to be a refugee at all. Of course they don't. But in the global South, or in island states, but in the global south in general, but in island states as well, if you're literally fighting for your right to exist, that means you're fighting for your cultural heritage. Your heritage of thousands of years uh, is tied to the sand, it's tied to the sea, it's tied to this, the sun. Um, isn't it great if uh, another island state or another land is giving you place a place to leave? So of the 100,000 people that live in Kiribati, uh, the, the, another island state of Timor-Leste has pledged some land for them, but it's not their land. So this is literally how they're going about, uh, it's one of the approaches within the climate negotiations. Now within the negotiations themselves, the climate justice manifests itself in the language in, of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities. Now this concept has been, it's, it's been there for over 20 years now, right? Under Kyoto, what we saw is that there was that literally between Global South and Global North were divided. You had Annex One, you had Annex Two countries. Annex One countries were told to go away. Uh, here's the targets you need to reach. You go away, you come back, and when, when you reach them, and they didn't. Uh, under Paris, trying to learn from the mistakes made in Copenhagen in 2009, um, they came up with this bottom up approach. The bottom up approach saying, okay, all states, all of you now go away, tell us what you can do. And then you know, with, the, uh, with, the, with the foresight that you're going to then start that as your baseline and then ratchet up ambition. This is why 2020 was supposed to be such an important year for climate negotiations, because we were supposed to, after it's five years since Paris, we were supposed to see the ratcheting up of ambition as Dr. Seeley already said. So we missed that opportunity and now we've moved into 2021. We might be missing this opportunity. I've already heard uh, rumors uh, that it, COP26 is canceled already this year. I hope not, but uh, it is 
really, really important to understand how we sit and how climate justice plays out when it comes to the global south. Because I'll bring it up again. The first is, uh, is responsibility. The global south is not historically responsible for the current state of affairs. The second is vulnerability. Uh, they tend to be the most vulnerable uh, uh, to the effects of climate change. They're already, they've been already feeling them for years now. The third would be adaptive capacity, um, the ability to adapt to these changes. This is where the money is needed, right? You need a lot of these countries, they've got nothing to mitigate. So they need the, they need the finance out there through these mechanisms that come out of these conference of parties uh, to finance them. And the fourth, and quite importantly, in terms of COVID-19, is this concept of representation. For years, decades now, the Global South has been underrepresented at the climate negotiations. Now this is changing in the past decade. I've, I've, I've seen the, Af I work mostly with the Africa group. It's, it's getting a better, a bigger voice. Uh, Oasis has a bigger, has a much bigger voice now than it, perhaps it did before. But the debate out there now needs to figure out uh, how they're going to be represented in COVID-19 because we need finance to come out of COVID-19, uh, of COVID COP26. We need finance to come out of COP26 and we need to cut emissions. We need those goals to be ratcheted up because we're nowhere near achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius as was set out six years ago now in the Paris Agreement. So, and the most important is that the Global South needs to be listened to. And, uh, and this is where COVID-19 is rearing its ugly head because we already have debates around the fact that uh, all participants need to be face to face, but you also need in that face to face, they need to be vaccinated. So this idea of vaccines is coming in and coming in strong because just because the UK is vaccinated, for example, doesn't mean that those in Sierra Leone are going to be vaccinated. So are they going to be able to participate? Probably not. And so this is, this is a, it, it, it's just, um, it's just, goes back to this idea of representation again and having uh, having countries already underrepresented this is potentially putting them back in uh, putting them back again so uh, with that I'll close my remarks there actually um, I'm happy to discuss any of those things I've been bringing, I've brought up there thank you very much Simon again really really useful uh, I think taking forward this conversation and, and I think uh, the, the line so far seems rather more towards pessimism than the hope that I, I had at the beginning, but I guess unfortunately around um, climate change and climate justice and these broad questions, perhaps there are good grounds for more pessimism than hope, but I have lots of themes there again, I think I hope we'll, we'll take up some more in the discussion. Um, Hilary, let me quickly pop, pass on to you so, so we do have some time to, to talk and, and take some questions from, from those who've come to listen to us. Go ahead, Hilary. Thanks, could you activate my screen sharing the same way you do activate to Dr. Hortons, please? It should work yeah. now. Yeah, it does. Thank you. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Can you still see the PowerPoint like this? Yeah. All right. I'll start my timer, so I'll make sure I'm judicious in the timing. Well, thanks so much, uh, Nick, for arranging this and organizing and having me here today. And thanks to everybody who's spoken already uh, before me. There's so much to take in there. Um, for my introduction, I'm going to focus on multilateral efforts, specifically to understand um, how small states are using multilateral approaches to mitigate vulnerability and increase resilience in this dual fight against COVID-19 and climate change. And in honor of our partnership with the University of West Indies today, I'm going to try to focus on examples from the Caribbean, but many of the points are transferable to cases in other regions as well, particularly the Pacific. And given the brevity of our opening remarks, I'll offer two opportunities and a big challenge. And then maybe I'll expand and offer some comparisons with small states and other regions in the discussion afterwards. Uh, so let's, let's have the glass half full first, and we'll start with some opportunities um, and starting with these, in the small state literature, we find that scholars like Baldur Thorhalsen and Alison Bales have argued that when seeking to reduce the impact of a shock 
small states adopt what we call a shelter-seeking behavior. So in terms of the economic crisis brought about by COVID-19, small states seek the economic shelter afforded by international organizations to offset their inbuilt structural uh, weaknesses with external assistance. And so uh, a good example in this case, I think, is that St. Lucia has partnered with the Sustainable Development Investment Partnership, which is um, a joint initiative of the World Economic Forum and the OECD, which is supporting developing countries with accessing private investment to pursue the sustainable development goals. So as part of this partnership, um, St. Lucia will be uh, supported to produce a country financing roadmap. And this is intended to support partner countries to identify new sources of capital to mitigate the adverse impact of COVID-19. And we're just listening to Simon talking about that finance challenge. And so by collaborating across both public and private sectors, these kinds of initiatives can support the building of more resilient socioeconomic structures and the development of best practices that can be replicated by other developing countries. So St. Lucia is one of only two pilot countries in this program at the moment. So it's quite an exciting opportunity because if it works, it could bode well for other small states as well. And so then in addition to seeking shelter and securing financial assistance through international institutions, uh, small states have also been vocal on global platforms and linking the pandemic to the other significant crisis we're here to talk about in today's workshop, which is, of course, the climate change challenge. And so I'm actually going to talk quite a bit about AOSIS. So Dr. Seeley, feel free to tell me if I'm getting it all wrong at the end of my, my points. But I really wanted to point out that the height of the COVID-19 outbreak in April 2020, uh, the government of Belize, which is the chair um, currently of the Alliance of Small Island States, um, 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 well, at the, at the time convened the Virtual Placencia Ambition Forum to determine means by which the response to COVID-19 can strengthen more sustainable climate action. And so for um, small island states, as Dr. Horton showed in her presentation, climate change continues to loom large as this existential challenge to livelihood, security, well-being, but the dramatic increase in, uh, for instance, the disposal of single-use plastics, such as PPE gear and masks, because of uh, the pandemic, was poses a distinct problem for uh, climate, biodiversity, and health security. So these small states are sounding the need for the global community to maintain sustainability at the heart of the pandemic response. Um, and importantly, climate targets must be incorporated into stimulus packages so that resilience building efforts drive a green recovery, as Dr. Chingy was pointing out. In the same way that a global pandemic requires a global response, the Placencia Ambition Forum was emphasizing the necessity of restructuring global financial systems to improve access to the finances necessary uh, for all countries to meet the targets of the Paris Agreements. And this is particularly important because COVID-19 forced the World Ocean Summit to be canceled, COP26 to be postponed to 2021, which we're currently looking ahead to in the UK, but as Dr. Seeley pointed out, you know, that's the what's going to come out of that is is might not even be what we're hoping for. And so, by linking COVID nineteen and climate change crises, it's really small states that are keeping long term sustainability firmly on the international agenda because they recognize that it will remain fundamental to international security, stability, and prosperity long after the pandemic passes. And so, I've put this quote from the Placencia Ambition Forum declaration, which says that what we lack in resources and capacity, we make up for in determination. And that determination is the bid to hold industrialized nations to their commitments in the pursuit of actual net zero emissions by 2050 and the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, <laughs> moving on to the challenges. Um, I'm typically an international relations scholar, not strictly an economist, but in this case, security and economics cannot be separated on this subject. Since the economic impact of the pandemic has induced both 
demand and supply side shocks, small economies, which are already disproportionately exposed to fluctuations in global markets because small states are disproportionately reliant on trade, they will suffer heavily from the decline in global growth as larger actors also enter into recession. And small states are not all the same. So for instance, the small island developing states largely lack the same fiscal space and liquidity to compensate in the same way as small advanced economies like Singapore or Malta, which have deployed enormous financial recovery packages. And so without the leverage to revise the terms of access to concessional finance through international financial institutions, many small island developing states will struggle to emerge from this crisis. And I know that initiatives like the G20 debt repayment suspension are, are a step in the right direction. And this includes this um, excludes middle income countries. So you end up with a situation where a country like Belize has suffered severe flooding after hurricanes Etna and Iota last year. Uh, crops were destroyed, homes, infrastructure. And so do, are they not, you know, do they do they not deserve and need assistance? It's not, there's a disconnect there. And this is why I've put this quote from Christopher Coy, who is a minister of state in Belize finance ministry, in an interview just this month with Climate News, uh, where he said, we find ourselves underwater and at risk of sinking even deeper. We know that small states are predominantly policy takers, not makers of international financial policies. And so there's a limit to what they can do without structural change to build resilience and enable green recovery and development. So in addition to debt service suspension, EOSIS have called on the UN to work with the small island developing states on a whole host of practical recommendations to restructure external debt obligations and the way to foster future economic stability and you can read all their you know detailed proposals in their policies on their website but at the same time to realize these fundamental changes to international rules and regulations you still need the support of larger actors within multilateral fora and so Lois Young, who's uh, Belize's permanent representative to the UN, um, explained it perfectly when she said, we need to have some big voices stick up for us. We need to have some big brothers, big sisters. We're not in the league of the big countries in these institutions. We can do our best, but we need some big advocates to speak up for us. Um, and so I think that um, we can see that, you know, the small island developing states cannot enact all these changes alone. And so concerted and committed assistance from larger counterparts will remain essential for the fiscal position of these small states to be improved, to enable them to recover from COVID-19 and to divert resources to essential security matters, including the fight against climate change. But so long as the largest and most wealthy powers can continue to adopt protectionist and insular strategies like the ones that prevailed through much of 2020. You know, we'll keep having workshops for ideas. IOSIS can put forward the best ideas and policy plans, but we'll actually see little implementation. And so I wanted to close with this uh, statement that um, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres shared at the Placencia Ambition Forum that I was talking about earlier, where he said that the social and economic devastation caused by climate disruption will be many times greater than the current pandemic. And now is not the time for retreat. So that's really my push for the, this, uh, this need for action and uh, concerted assistance and not insular nationalism and protectionism. And I'll leave it there and I'll open up to the discussions um, and to hear whether Dr. Seeley can relate to this or whether I've uh, academically got it all wrong. <laughs> so that, that was really great. Thank you very much, uh, Hilary and Dr. Becker. That, that, that was a really, really useful set of open reflections. Now, um, what, what I'm going to do is, um, I see we already got one question um, that's come in, but I'm going to ask those of you who are in the audience to have a think about your questions. And I will, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start off the discussion maybe and ask a few questions. And whilst, whilst um, the panelists are, are, are reflecting on those, um, please put any questions you have in the chat and then we'll share them with the panel. So I, I wanted to, just building on, on um, your contribution so far, there are a couple of things I'd be really interested to hear expanded on. So I'll, I'll sort of, I'll ask the questions to everybody 
in, in, in the group, but, but feel free to chop and change and pick and choose which, which ones you'd like to answer. So the first one is, is a point that was brought up by, um, I think, by both, both uh, Dr. Wharton and Dr. Seeley, which it relates to relates to the kind of regional, the regional institutions and regional um, partners. So, so I'm, I'd be interested if, if, um, if you'd be um, willing to expand a little bit on the function and scope of regional institutions in, in the Caribbean and responding to the corona crisis. So I'm interested also in, in to some extent, the intersection with some of the uh, regional institutions like the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, where, where you know, that they're related to these climate questions. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a kind of a, a clear answer I'm looking for, but I'd be interested to know a little bit more about about, I mean, Hugh, uh, you say, you know, that really there's, there was no collective action to, to, to a great extent. And I, that seems to me interesting that there wasn't a more of an overlap given the existence of these collective institutions. And well, were there any successes um, where you saw these regional actors or regional associations making, making sort of interventions in the COVID space that sort of built on this relationship to climate? So that's kind of one question I, I'd, be, I'd be interested in, in hearing. Uh, a little more perhaps on it. I guess the second question that, that again uh, is, is I think important, it came up in a couple of conversations, which is to do with um, what kind of partners um, smaller states need to effectively respond both to things like COVID-19, uh, the security implications and to the security implications of climate. Huh? Uh, in this context, I want to ask a more direct question, which is to do with, I guess, rising powers or medium sized or, or sort of um, states and that, that, that um, uh, are they, you know, are they friends or foes of of um, smaller states in the context of COVID and and climate change? Obviously, in relationship to climate change, you know, the countries like Brazil and India are large emitters. Um, they they they've refused ambitious mitigation targets in the context of the UN COP discussions. So, you know, I, I'm wondering wondering of whether their relative power in this context um, has some implications for thinking about these questions of agency. Um, for smaller states um, in, in stepping into um, into the into the COP discussion, um, and I guess that turns on to the third thing I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about, which is this question of agency and, and what kind of positive agency um, smaller states on the receiving end of of greater crises um, that are likely to arise out of the climate crisis, right? So I mean, COVID nineteen is is as as was said by many of the panelists today, perhaps to some extent a temporary. Um, phenomenon. It's it's huge and it's caused enormous impact. But at some point, we can expect it will it will pass, um, e even if it does enormous damage in the process. But climate change will will be ongoing. Will likely get significantly more um, serious, regardless of of um, our efforts to limit um, global temperature rise. So I'm wondering uh, if you would be willing to reflect a little more on what agency. Maybe tell a kind of positive story. I'm interested not not to tell a positive story, but I'm interested in where the spaces for agency might be and where we might think about the agency of smaller states in terms of climate justice and how they might influence these debates um, going forward. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave those to the panel and, and you can sort of respond as you will to those. Um, we also have a, a question directly to, to Dr. Horton, who's interested in how, um, from Max Kindred, who, who wanted to ask about how Jamaica is dealing with um, land clearing for agriculture, especially on the hilly areas that lead to land erosion. Uh, and is interesting in legislation and enforcement uh, around these. So let me now pass back to, to the panel and, and um, perhaps we should, uh, we'll go in the same order we did with, with speaking, starting with Dr. Orton, if, that, if that's all right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Max, thanks for your question. Uh, the question is about how is Jamaica dealing with the land with land and clear land clearing for agriculture, especially on the hilly areas that leads to erosion, and how does it deal with it in legislation and in real life with enforcement? So uh, that's a very good question. As I mentioned in my presentation, the Jamaican government has um, passed the Protected Areas Act and has protected uh, 15 areas that has been designated as um, special areas required for protection to preserve the species and biodiversity of the region in, in those um, localities. Now, uh, as it relates to agriculture, the, the government is, 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 is fully concerned, um, aware that 
uh, some farmers are using unsustainable practices slash and burn um, type agriculture um, farming practices. However, um, to mitigate um, that, that situation, the government has imposed what I mentioned earlier, which is the, um, the effort at um, carbon fixing, the planting of um, 10 trees. So all citizens, and we have a not such a huge population, our population is 2.9. A million people, that's the population in Jamaica. And uh, all citizens can access 10 trees to, to plant as, as, a, as a means of um, fixing um, the, 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 the environment and not only that, but also adding to, um, to, to the situation where trees have been removed in an unsustainable sustainable sort of way. So that is what is being done. Um, there's much more that needs to be done concerning enforcement. And even with the act itself, the, the Protected Areas Act, and the government is aware of that and has indicated that it will be um, embarking on a public awareness campaign to sensitize individuals within the society concerning um, the importance of protecting um, the environment and specifically also of protecting the, the specially designed uh, or designated um, areas, um, the 15 areas that they have um, identified. And uh, so that, that is where it is at concerning um, enforcement and um, the protection of um, efforts to, to, to to carbon fix. Now, uh, in, in part of the, the presentation, I, I can't remember who, but there was, a, I think it was um, Hillary who mentioned about efforts to um, eliminate um, single use of um, plastic uh, bags and, and sort of styrofoam um, uh, plastics. Um, the government has embarked on that. Um, in fact, I think we're leading in the Caribbean region where that is concerned, um, where a ban has now been placed and citizens are not allowed to, to use um, single, single pla um, use plastic bags and use these styro styrofoam type um, plastics. So that is also an effort that um, is, is made by, by the government. And uh, yeah, so those are the, the main ones now that um, the government is embarking on. Uh, there's much more that needs to be done in terms as, of, of enforcement, uh, but the National Environmental Protection Agency um, is actively operating to ensure that um, endangered species are, are, are um, there's a protection of endangered species and um, is, is, is monitoring all the efforts, the developmental efforts that the country has embarked on concerning where, where um, trees need to be removed to put up residential um, developments. So all those are monitored. There's a process involved in terms of they do the environmental um, assessments to determine whether or not those, those developments um, are, are sustainable or whether or not buildings should be erected in um, certain locations. So there are efforts that needs um, that are being done, but as um, Hillary mentioned, and I think it was um, Simon talking about um, uh, right to exist and also talking about the, the, the importance of financing and also the importance of connecting um, uh, what's it now public finance to stimulation uh, um, packages and that's what is required now um, to ensure that we don't lose sight of um, this quest to preserve our climate and to secure our future uh, because without an, an, the, the, the protection of the environment then we are all at risk. 
Well, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, um, Dr. Hubbard. So, D Dr. Seeley, I'll pass it to you next. Thanks, Nicholas. I was I was busy scribbling down notes, trying to figure out well what is it exactly that I want to say in, in in response. So again, I'm going to be all over the place. And uh, Dr. Briffin, your your presentation was 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 spot on. The only time I shook my head and you picked it up was 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 when I was when you were saying Belize is the current chair of the Alliance of Small Island States. Uh, Antigua and Barbuda took over in January. Um, Belize did an excellent job over the last two years. Thank you for for mentioning the the Palacencia Ambition Forum, uh, and now we're in the in the competent hands of, of Antigua and Barbuda um, for, the, for the next two years. Um, I actually have the role of, um, and thank you to Antigua and Barbuda for asking me to take over the role of the lead coordinator for, for mitigation. Um, uh, so that will be what I'm doing. Nicholas, I'm going to get in trouble with my masters, my political masters, if I if I if I don't say that yes, some regional institutions did work, or on our work and under under the COVID situation, uh, for example, our Caribbean Public Health Agency CARFA um, has been used by all of the islands uh, for, for for testing uh, for for those that don't have the actual uh, kits and can't identify variants. Um, uh, CARFA has 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 stepped in. There, of course, we have the regional security system, the RSS, uh, that's that's been still been moving essential goods and services uh, and people uh, around the region. Our own institution, University of West Indies, I will get shot if I if I don't mention that that we've been providing uh, as much as we can in terms of, of, of helping with capacity. Our epidemiologists have been working with 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 the governments. Um, to develop um, contact tracing methods, et cetera. Um, or students in Barbados were involved in a house-to-house -house survey uh, recently where they, they um, went through the entire island in the space of two weeks, uh, trying to, to, to determine uh, those who may potentially uh, have COVID. Then Nicholas, you asked about what type of partners do we need? To, to, to move forward. And it immediately struck me about our former prime minister, um, the Honorable L. Wolfen Barrow, he had, a, he had a phrase for our foreign policy. He said, friends of all, satellites of none. And that, that has become our, our mantra, at least for Barbados, and I would say for the, for the, for the Caribbean uh, as, as well. So we recognize we're small. We recognize that we have no big stick that we can wave. Um, we can't nuke anybody if they if they if 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 we don't like them, um, and but we are sovereign states. We are proud nations, and we're not going to let anyone trample all over us. Uh, Simon, you mentioned Copenhagen, and that brings back memories. My my first COP was in two thousand and seven, and then I virtually attend them all. Uh, since then. And I remember in, in the hall in Copenhagen, there was this big globe of the world. But Barbados wasn't on it. Jamaica wasn't on it. The, the globe wasn't big enough to show the small islands. And every day I would walk past and I would look at that globe and I'd say, oh my gosh. And then when I'm facing our developed country partners, negotiators, I realized that for some of them, Yes, small islands are, di are dispensable. If it comes to, to your economic decline versus my existence, you will choose not to have the economic decline because we're dispensable. It doesn't matter what we've brought to the culture of the world in terms of our music, our, spo our sports, our writing, nothing. You ask me the, the population of Barbados, and I tell you 280,000 people, and immediately you shut down. You're dispensable. We will find you a small piece of land in the marshlands or Everglades somewhere, and we'll put you there. So I negotiate on that in that context, recognizing that the person in front of me doesn't really care if I exist or not. So you ask me how do we move forward about agency? Small islands will always be the conscience of the convention. We are not going to give up. We will not go slowly and silently into the night. 
That's not the role that we will play. No. We will kick and we will fight and we will take every success and we will build from there and we will move forward. Notice the word two degrees was not mentioned in the last hour and 15 minutes. We talked about 1.5. We're already at 1.25. But we've talked about 1.5. Two degrees is off the table. That's one small moral victory that, that we've taken. Now, my role as the, as the lead negotiator for mitigation, and I've been instructed to do so by the chair of AOSIS, is to come up with a plan as to how do we deal with all the emitters, not only the traditional historical emitters. And I'm not talking about not stopping about lame blame. There's a lot of blame still to be talked about. And when you talk about loss and damage, we couldn't get the words liability or compensation into the Paris Agreement, could not. That doesn't mean that we haven't given up that fight either when you talk about climate justice. It just means we have to move to another front. It can be within the UNFCCC. All right, fine. But how do we engage with, the, with Brazil? How do we engage with India? How do we engage with China? Recognizing that a ton of CO2 is a ton of CO2. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. Now, I'm not going to talk about our strategy in front of everyone. I'm saying that we're thinking about it. And we need to know how to engage. And perhaps the mantra, friends of all, satellites of none, will guide us as to how we move forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's a really fascinating. Uh, thank you. Uh, Simon. Thank you again. Uh, there's just so much to say. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, I guess I'll start with, uh, with uh, understanding what these actors bring to the table in terms of how they can act in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the negotiations. So in my work with the Africa group, we're looking at the studying the Africa group. What I, what I noticed is the change since COP12 in Nairobi on how uh, uh, the Africa group kind of works within the negotiations. And what they do bring uh, to the table is what they have is a, a certain moral legitimacy. Dr. Seely talked about the fact that they're, the island states are the heart and the conscience of the, of, the, of the negotiations. And I'm fully on board with that. And I think what we have here is that you have a set of countries, whether you're talking about the Africa group or you're talking about uh, OASIS or the, the other, the, all of these other kind of groups of negotiators that, can, that are not historically responsible uh, and also that they just have nothing to cut. So if you have the, what they bring to the table, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot finance other countries and you cannot, and then you have no emissions to really, to really cut, then then you need to bring something else, and that is this kind of uh, moral legitimacy, if you will, um, in terms of the groups. But within that, for example. Um, uh, the disparity between African states, for example, just because you have one group, they're coming to the table, their strength in numbers, they can talk on behalf of 54 countries, 1.2 billion people. But within the group itself, then you see divides and, and uh, within it, because what finance means something different to Ethiopia than it does to Botswana, for example. Uh, and we witnessed this, but they do come to the table with that one, one voice. So in terms of, um, uh, how and who they can work with. Again, I, I, I guess the, uh, uh, Dr. Silly said this already, but the some of the loudest voices in the room are Tuvalu, are uh, the Maldives. They're the ones th that are shouting from the rooftops in these negotiations. And it's really important to, know, like, to, to note that. Um, um, but in terms of how to work with other, with other larger, larger than these new larger uh, emitting countries like Brazil and China, um, I guess they, that you need to come with, uh, with, uh, 
Well, I don't have an answer for that, actually. <laughs> like you, you need to come to the negotiating table within those smaller, those smaller groups to understand what's important uh, for, for those within the Africa group, for example, the Seychelles, Mauritius, they're more aligned to Oasis than they are to the Africa group, or Egypt would be more aligned to the Arab group. Than, and the reason that the Africa group in the beginning started to, to, get, to gain more power is there became divisions within the group of 77 plus China. Uh, and where they started to dif differ in their approach to in their approach to the negotiations, um, there there is scope uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, in terms of uh, in the lead up to Paris, I was a I was a uh, an, an advisor to the Nordic Council and the Nordic Council five countries. The reason those are five relatively small but rich countries. Um, they were convinced they didn't know how to work with the Africa group. They, they were used to working, they were used to being seen as these clean green countries, which of course they're not, uh, uh, in the negotiations, right? So they were, and all of a sudden the Africa group was pointing fingers at them and saying, no, no, you're not doing what you said you were supposed to do. Where's this hundred billion that were, that, that uh, is supposed to be in the pots, for example. But and then they, because they were, they were determined that the Paris Agreement was going to be a success, or at least was going to come out in 2015. And there was this underlying, they were convinced that if it was going to be a country throwing the Paris Agreement under a bus, it was going to come from the African countries. So that's where they, they, they literally hired people to write reports to figure out how to go into the negotiations and how to, to negotiate with certain, uh, certain of these groups. Um, so there is scope there, and there's a there, there's there is scope. I'm, I'm not unhopeful uh, on on how uh, governments negotiate together. I'm just, uh, I guess, I'm still a bit pe pessimistic if we're talking in Brazil and India uh, in uh, in the negotiations on on what they're, they're just such big powers compared to to the small island states, for example. I'll leave it there. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, it's, I'm just too neat. That's great. Uh, um, Hilary, go, go for it. Um, Dr. Griffith. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, and uh, Dr. Silly, you absolutely caught me in my Freudian slip where I meant to say the chair of AOSIS at the time and, uh, and then then slip. But of course, we know um, Antigua and Barbuda have taken over and it's important to note as well that they've just that the chair has actually written to President Biden and is, is calling for assistance on uh, on these issues, which shows one of the strategies perhaps smaller actors can employ in trying to bring uh, these larger backers on side. And I'm going to um, tackle your question, Nick, about agency, the final question you asked, because I think that's the one I can speak to to build on these themes. And I definitely don't want my remarks to come across as though small states have no agency, especially when it comes to global problems. If we look at uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, for instance, um, this, this was really born out of in uh, the 1962 when Malta's ambassador to the UN, Arvid Pardo, um, went to the UN and said, we need to designate the seabed as uh, what he called common heritage of mankind, really born out of the recognition that developed states were always going to take these resources at the expense of developing countries. And that kickstart, you know, he fed into the mood of the time, the, the concerns of the non-aligned movement, pushing for a new international economic order, a more distributive justice and so on. But but it took off, they built a coalition and eventually kick, and kickstarted the process that led to the law of the sea. And a few years later in the 1980s, again, on the on the advice of Judge Athard, who is um, currently judge of the, Interna the tribunal for the, um, the law of the sea, but was a founding uh, contributor to AOSIS in its, in its origins as well, so showing a nice circle here. Um, he said we also need to designate weather as a common heritage. And actually, Malta's ambassador to the UN, on the basis of this, went and said and kickstarted the process that led to the Kyoto Protocol and things that we know today on climate legislation. So these came from small, a small country trying to be as Malta's ambassador to the UN at the time, uh, Tabone said, the, the conscience of mankind. And I think this feeds into both what both Dr. Seeley was saying earlier and also Simon about um, climate justice as well. So the role that smaller states can play in, in this moral component, as, as Simon put it, really effectively. And so, so when you marshal coalitions, you 
effectively and feed into the mood of the time and all of that, you can generate change. So you, it's not that small states cannot do anything whatsoever and own, are only price takers, but it is it is challenging. And so we, we even have something like, and um, Simon was talking about sea level rise earlier. You know, we have the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but it was signed before sea level rise was recognized as a problem. So now many small islands risk losing their EEZs because their the law has no, uh, has no way to compensate for this. So they're pushing for recognition of permanent EEZs without loss of jurisdiction at the UN. And so, we need bigger actors to support this. And if they don't want to do it for moral reasons, one way to do it is say, in realist terms, if you don't support this, there's nothing to stop your, your competitors, you know, feeding into this US-China strategic competition side, not recognizing these areas coming in, fishing, mining, and so on. And so maybe one way is to play into their realist concerns, even if they think that these small islands are dispensable, as uh, Dr. Seeley put it. And um, the last point I'll make about agency is also to say that uh, COVID really showed that in comparison to the nationalistic and insular approaches taken by many large countries, um, small states are willing to take action. Singapore and New Zealand had released a joint declaration where they actually pledged to remove tariffs for essential goods and to open trade and supply chains. And a number of small states joined this from Brunei to Laos to Uruguay, even little Nauru. And they all said that they were going to come together and keep trade routes open for health and commodities and services. And so even though this was born out of necessity because they, some will say, need to trade, um, you know, it showed their willingness to act and to collaborate even when leadership wasn't forthcoming from the US and China. And so I think they are willing to take agency. The only problem is when it's a global problem that they cannot solve only by themselves, we need to get larger actors on side. And that's where there is a certain degree of limitation to that agency. Thank you. That was um, really, um, really so interesting. Go, go on, um, um, Dr. Seeley, uh, your hands up. Go for it. Well, I just want to jump back in on that last point on the on the agency uh, that 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 uh, Dr. Briffle was mentioned. I, for for a lot of small islands, um, adaptation is the priority. Yes, and a lot of our developed country partners consider adaptation to be a priority. I share that view, yes, but I also think that we can't adapt to a three degree world. So prevention is always better than the cure. Now, would you lend me money to mitigate my emissions in, in Barbados? You probably think it's not a great priority or total emissions are 2 million tons per year. So 2 million tons and the whole world emits about 50 gigatons. So you can do your, your work or your percentages. Now we could stop emitting everything and we won't have much for the, an impact on the global situation but what it will do is it will create the fiscal space to allow us to invest in resilience in other words if you're a small open economy that's important fossil fuels and you can replace those fossil fuels with indigenous renewable energy sources then it's not a climate change issue for us it's an economic issue to decarbonize and decarbonize quickly, but to do so, we need access to capital and, and cheap capital because going through renewable energy burns capital. And so, and so the cost of the capital def almost defines or oh, 50% of the of the uh, of the feasibility of the of the project. So I just wanted to point out from an agency standpoint, Barbados is 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 not unique, but in a special situation where we are one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Uh, so although we're 280,000 people, people, we are essentially a small city. And we intend to completely decarbonize our economy by 2010. Let me repeat that. Completely decarbonize our economy, the electricity sector and transport sector by 2030. And you all can see, well, that's pie in the sky. Because we're small, we don't have the inertia you have. Because we're small, we don't have the stranded assets that you're gonna have. So we can do it and we can do it quickly. And we can show the rest of the world how it can be done. How you can get high penetration rates of intermittent sources of energy like solar and wind with today's technology. 
with high energy storage, with batteries, etc. I don't want to get too technical, but, but when you talk about agency, it's not only on the moral side. In the context of climate change, there are no developed countries and developing countries. In the context of climate change, there are only wrongly developed countries and developing countries that have to learn from the mistakes that others have made. So there is no, there is no model out there for me to follow to say, yes, this is a sustainable development path for me when it comes to, 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 to climate change and being, and being resilient and being low carbon. But we can do it. We in Barbados can do it. We, we have the ability to do it. And we will show the rest of the world how to move forward. Thanks. That's a very elegant argument and, a, and, and, and um, an important one, uh, I think. We have a, a few questions um, coming in. I'm going to kind of um, synthesize them in, into, I think, what the two points are. So I think I think because they, they bear upon some of the things we've already been speaking about. So the first the first one is to do with what 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 needs to be there to ensure that COP COP delegates can can get to COP and 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 have these conversations and you know so the, Max Kinder is asking about sort of vaccination and so on but I, I guess it's this broader question of what what can or should be done in in the context uh, of, of, of of your 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 understanding to to make sure that climate negotiations can continue in the current situations and I guess is this to some extent a question of will or 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 maybe there are technical things that can be done. Could they be? Could it be done remotely? I mean, I don't. This is kind of questions that I'd be interested in, in hearing answers about. And to sort of synthesize the other two questions, I, I think they pertain more to the question of adaptation and building resilience. Um, so, obviously, money is always the issue um, in, in this context. But what else on, on top of money is there? What other kinds of support uh, uh, and and uh, and, and action need to be taken. So in particular, Amy's asking about the role of security actors in relationship to climate change. And in the context of the UK's MOD's recent report um, to, to ask the question of, you know, I guess what, what actual security actors could be doing in the context, I guess, of climate change more broadly, but perhaps we could speak in relationship to COVID uh, as well. And maybe if there are any intersections between those two also. Um, uh, I'm, uh, Suzette, do you feel do you feel comfortable? I feel you're always starting first, which is terribly unfair if you're the first speaker. So maybe we should reverse the order so you get a few minutes to think before you have to give your answer. Um, Simon, did you do you feel like um uh, do you feel like you could you could come in and have a have a have a thought maybe particularly on what what we, what needs to be there to make the discussions around um COP um happen? Did you address that to me? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I mean, do, do you think like uh, are, are there yeah, are there are there um well is it would it be possible to run it remotely under COVID? Um or are there concrete things that could be done to make it more viable? Um remotely, once again, if if it's done remotely, I mean we've seen other things do, been done remotely, but the problem with that is immediately you have what about those countries that have low connectivity? What are those countries that are, what, what what about those participants that are not going to be able to participate because they cannot connect? properly. Um, and, and then it, it goes back to representation where you see the highly connected countries are the ones that are there and the ones that are negotiating. And um, I think what needs to happen is, uh, apart from what needs to happen is we need a, a worldwide global vaccine rollout so that people from all over the from all different end, ends of the globe are, are vaccinated, if we're going to start traveling around again. Uh, and if who knows how many people will go to to cop uh, 26, but the smallest COP I've ever been to, and I've been to eight of them, was 20,000 people. So it's there. There's a lot of actors uh, um, that are that are participating. Um, but saying that, I mean, if we're just to let to have some sort of positive, or uh, if we're going to look at COVID-19, I think one thing, one thing, and climate change is one thing here is that we've seen with granted various uh, degrees of success, governments address a crisis on very quickly. Um, again, varying degrees of success. But at least we've, see, we've seen that argument that, 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 uh, that countries have been making that we're, we need to, uh, we're not gonna stop using fossil fuels tomorrow. We're gonna, we need, we, we need a plan for 2050. I've even heard 2100. Um, 
that's that's no longer a viable argument as far as I'm concerned. And then and the, and the fact that we have lots of renewables out there as well that are cheaper than they ever been they've ever been. And so back to Dr. Uh, Seeley's point earlier about using a, 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 this idea that we can we have we can look forward and we can build resilience. The problem with climate change, the problem with the world we live in, is we we. We base our, our, our ideas on building for the future based on the past, but we can't do that anymore. We have to build on the future, predicting what's going to happen because of climate change. So if the idea that if we can do anything is take from COVID-19, this is a learnable moment, a teachable moment where we don't build back, we don't go to the business as usual model that everyone's desperate to go back to. We build forward as uh, I think it was Dr. Lucili. Someone said, we need to build forward. We need to think forward. And this is where, and I completely agree, a small island state like Barbados could be could be a trailblazer here. But if in, in terms of uh, Tammy's question in the chat about security actors and and uh, what this needs what needs to happen is these adaptive uh, capacity uh, problems need to be need to be need to be uh, need to be dealt with. So there needs to be uh, that those projects in place in order for that to happen. Thank you very much. I think I'm, we're going to mix up the order completely. So I'm going to go to, to Hillary next, uh, and then and then to um, uh, to Seth and then to Suzette and then to Hugh Hugh finally. So go go on, Hillary. Thanks. I think I can keep my answer quite quite short on this because I know the question was asking about something practical like like getting vaccinated for for COVID. But I think the more important thing is this willingness and, and this sense of commitment to undertaking the necessary reforms and, and things that need to take place because we have the ideas, we have the policy proposals, groups like AOSIS have put forward, you know, whole reports with our, which are not just outlining the problem, they're literally listing these are the solutions, but unless there is a willingness to implement these, uh, these changes, you know, they're we're going to keep keep having conversations like at, like the ones at COP, and then have people come back and say, "Oh, we didn't we didn't actually meet our targets, or we're we're unwilling to put in the the changes that that are necessary." And a lot of that comes from, um, you know, as Dr. Sealy was saying, thinking about countries in in the individual, and and that others are dispensable as long as it's not affecting, um, you know, your own your own. Um, your own situation, but I think a problem like COVID has shown us that you were not secure until everyone is secure and we, we need to find a way to light that same fire under the COVID challenge and to take um, and to improve things like, you know, best practices and because there's another question in the chat about, you know, is it just finances that we should be giving? Well, there's also the capital of knowledge and information and um, and here somewhere where um, I put in the chat off the back of what Dr. C was saying about flexibility, that small states can often be laboratories of innovation. You can test something much quicker and um, at smaller scale and then if it works scale it up and I'm actually um, on the ambassador program for a group called Island Innovation which is connecting islands from all over the world to share sustainability um, practices and knowledge so that um, to actually implement things in, so in local society that can can be shared across different regions so we need more of that as well, because we we tend to un, you know talk a lot about the economic factors and so on, but underplay the the knowledge capital as well in in doing a lot of this. So I think more willingness to co collab a, a willingness to implement change and a willingness to share and value knowledge capital as well, perhaps would be my contributions on that. Thank you very much, um, Hilary. I'll pass now to Dr. Horton, Suzette, uh, and then and then uh, and then um, finally on to QCB. Go on. Yeah, thank you. So answer the question about um, COP26. What can be done? Uh, when you're negotiating and when you're negotiating something as complex as um, climate security targets. There's just something that is different, a different sort of synergy that um, comes out when you have a more face-to-face -face interaction. I think the, the possibility exists for, despite the, the challenges, for it to be done remotely. 
but I think we would lose that synergy if it is done remotely and is not done um, in a face-to-face -face, uh, modality. So um, my recommendation as much as is possible to see how best it could be um, executed using a face-to-face -face, um, mode. Uh, we still have a lot of time. I think November is still a, a, a couple of months, many months away. Um, we're not sure what will happen. But in the absence of that, um, states are moving towards um, mass vaccination now. There is much talk about having immunity passports as a means or a stamp of approval for um, global travel. And I think that's the way that states should be going. Um, immunizing or va um, co um, doing COVID-19 vaccination of its populace. And once that happens, then um, persons will be able to travel and um, COVID, um, COP26 might be able to, to happen um, face to face. Concerning the other, um, and, and I know there are, there, there are issues about um, vaccine diplomacy, which was, was um, brought up earlier about the um, access to vaccines and how disproportionate the system is for um, small developing countries. But we are hoping that um, those issues will be overcome in the um, upcoming future. For um, Jamaica, for instance, we have received 50,000 um, doses of vaccines from India and um, PAHO has mentioned that 28.7 million doses, doses of vaccines will be um, gi given to Jamaica by May of, of this year. So we're hoping that, and I, and I think this is just one, one example of one country, but I think other countries are making, taking the steps necessary to have their, their populations, um, vac um, the vaccination being um, given to their populations. Concerning the, the, the second question about um, security actors and what can be done um, to um, address issues of uh, migration and um, climate related conflicts. I, I don't think that we, we should leave this just to security actors. This is everybody's business and we need to build resilience across the board. Governments need to, to, to build resilience to deal with the impacts of, of, of climate change. Um, law enforcers have to improve their capacities to deal with um, issues that will emerge, climate related issues. As I mentioned in my presentation, climate change is really a threat multiplier. So there will be um, increases in uh, transnational organized um, crimes, law enforcers and security actors have to build their resilience to deal with, with those issues. But uh, we also have to get everybody on board, the private sector is an important component in terms of, of how they conduct their production processes. We have to um, encourage them to use more sustainable Make a means of, of, of producing their products and um, selling their services. And importantly, we have to get the women on board, get the females involved, energize them, um, sensitize them about the issues concerning um, climate change and have them contribute as well as our um, mainly civil society groups, um, they also need to come on board. So it's about building resilience across the board to deal with this huge ex um, existential threat of climate change that um, is facing us at this particular time. So um, that, that, that's the, the, the way forward, I, I think. 
Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's, uh, really, uh, and indeed, it's important. It's the kind of question of civil society actors we actually haven't spoken about so, so much. But I think uh, I, I'm going to pass on to Dr. Hugh Seeley, and I think you're going to have the last word, um, Dr. Seeley, because uh, I, I think we've already run over the length of time I said this this webinar would go on for. So thank you all for sticking around. But I think Dr. Seeley, please take the last word, and then I'll, I'll, I'll thank you. Um, well, thanks, Nicholas, and I am conscious that that we. We've had some patient participants and, and we've gone on for, for, for quite a while. So I'll try to be as succinct as I can. The first question on the sharing of the, of the vaccines. Yes, um, I suspect that all delegates, um, if, if we get to Glasgow in November, will be vaccinated. I haven't gotten my vaccine yet. Um, if I, if, I would love to get the J&J because &J it's only one, one, one shot. Anyone with a J&J &J vaccine over there can send my way, let, let me know. Uh, but we'll take any. We'll take the Chinese, we'll take the Russian, we'll take the Indian, whatever. Just get us vaccinated and we'll get and, and get us there. Why? Because it's terribly important to move forward the agenda. The agenda is now getting blocked within the UNFCCC. Um, if we get to COP26, it's got to deal with four sub um, sorry, four subsidiary body agendas. Um, the, two, the two that we lost last year and the two that we're going to have uh, this year. If, if, it, if it's not held this year and it, and it pushes into the spring, you're going to have a jurisdictional fight between the UK and Africa as to who holds uh, the, next, the next call. Uh, and that, that could push a whole bunch of uh, time down, down the road. So it's, it's, it's important that we do meet. But I want to also address the question in the context of the last two, and that is the fight is not only at the call. The fight's not only at the UNFCCC. A matter of fact, most of the battles are won outside of that UNFCCC process. Paris was a success because, and I, and I know I oversimplified, but Paris was a success because the US and China had already decided what they were going to do before they came into the room. Sorry, UK, you would play a minor role. Sorry, EU, you played a very minor role. It was the two big elephants in the room that had to decide. All right. So we haven't spoken about the US. The US is back in play. And so I am hoping, fingers crossed, that the US and China are sitting down in a little small area somewhere. If they want to use Barbados as a place to come and talk, we will welcome you here very discreetly, come and have a chat, sort things out. Because that's not the UNFCCC. What I'm trying to make the point is, is that COP26, yes, is important. Yes, we have to move forward. Yes, we can get vaccinated. The remoteness of the issue is a real problem for small islands. Not only our connectivity, like Simon said, but we're all over the world. We've got three states, three regions. We've got, we got the Caribbean, the Pacific, and, and South China Seas. So how, how are we going to commit on, on, on communicating and get back to capital on real issues when we're in a different time zone? So there's, there's a real logistical problem for, for small islands to be represented uh, at, at, at COP26. And that's why I'm torn on this, but we really, really need to move forward as well. Last point, outside of the UNFCCC about, about the security actors and everything else, my belief is that as AOSIS, as the Alliance of Small Islands, we have to broaden the fight. We have to find different fronts to fight on besides the UNFCCC. So yes, this is a security issue. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is now a member of the Security Council, UN Security Council. Go fight it there. This is a human rights issue. Let's fight it within the UNF, UNHCR. Let's find every single area where we can fight. I've, I've told our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anytime you meet with, a, with another state, think climate change. Because in the long term, it doesn't matter what trade deal, short term trade deal they're, they're interested in entering into, into if they continue to emit, they're, they're saying you don't have the right to exist. Bear that in mind when, when, when you're dealing with, 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 with foreign policy. So last comment, yes, it is a security issue. Yes, we're gonna fight the battle on at least we should fight the battle on all fronts. COP26 is really, really, really important to move forward. But I would, I would rather postpone the COP than have a, than have a bad COP with bad decisions.
competitions because there was there was poor representation there as well. Thanks, Nicholas. Really, really appreciated the opportunity to, to, to be here today. I think it has been it has been um, school security studies absolute pleasure to to host host you all. So uh, I, basically, yeah, for me, I thank you so much to Dr. Horton, Dr. Seeley, um, Dr. Chinyi, and Dr. Um, Griffa. It's been a really fascinating discussion, and I, I, I'll send my thanks again via email. Um, thank you so much for contributing and talking to us, and I thank you also um, for for having this really inspiring discussion that that I hope. Um, is going to spark an enormous amount of interest in those listening, but also I hope can, can move forward in other ways as well. So thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I really appreciate your time this evening and sorry for keeping you longer than I said I would, um, but it was too interesting to end quickly. So thank you very much. Um, goodbye, H have a lovely evening or actually rest of your day um, over, in, over in Barbados in Jamaica. Goodbye, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, enjoy your lunch. Yes, we'll do. Yeah. <laughs>